Hitler's birthday, 1940. Against all hopelessness, Liesl still checked the mailbox after each afternoon throughout March and well into April. This was despite a Hans-requested visit from Frau Einrich, who explained to the Hubbermans that the foster care office had, had lost contact completely with Paula Memminger. Still, the girl persisted, and as you might think, each day when she searched the mail, there was nothing. Wolfgang, like the rest of Germany, was in the grip of preparing for Hitler's birthday. This particular year, with the development of the war and Hitler's current victorious position, the Nazi partisans of Moking wanted the celebration to be especially befitting. There would be a parade, marching, music, singing. There would be a fire. While Liesel walked the streets of Moking, picking up and delivering washing and ironing, Nazi party members were accumulating fuel. A couple of times, Liesel was a witness to, a, to men and women knocking on doors, asking people if they had any materi material that they felt should be done away with or destroyed. Papa's copy of the Moking Express announced that there would be a celebratory fire in the town square, which would be attended by all local Hitler youth divisions. It would commemorate not only the Führer's birthday, but the victory over the enemies and over the restraints that had held Germany back since the end of World War I. Any materials it requested from such times, newspapers, posters, books, flags, and any found propaganda of our enemies should be brought forward to the Nazi party office on Munich Street. Even Schiller Strasse, the Road of Yellow Stars, which was still awaiting its renovation, was ransacked one last time to find something, anything, to burn in the name of Führer's glory. It would have come as no surprise if certain members of the party had gone away and published a thousand or so books or posters of poisonous moral matter simply to incinerate them. Everything was in place to make April 20th magnificent. It would be a day full of burning and cheering and book thievery. In the Hubberman's household that morning, all was typical. That stub curls looking out the window again, cursed Rosa Hubberman. Every day, she went on. What are you looking at this time? Oh, moaned Papa with delight. The flag cl cloaked his back from the top of the window. You should have a look at this woman I can see. He glanced over his shoulder and grinned at Liesl. I might just go and run after her. She leaves you for dead, Mama. Schwine, she, took, she shook the wooden spoon at him. Papa continued looking out the window at an imaginary woman in a very real corridor of German flags. On the streets of Molking that day, each window was decorated for a Führer. In some places, like Frau Diller's, the glass was vigorously washed and the swastika looked like a jewel on a red and white blanket. In others, the flag trundled from the ledge like washing hung out to dry, but it was there. Earlier, there had been a minor cal calamity. The Hubbermans couldn't find their flag. They'll come for us, Mama warned her husband. They'll come and take us away. They. We have to find it. At one point, it seemed like Papa might have to go down to the basement and paint a flag on one of his drop sheets. Thankfully, it turned up, buried behind the accordion in the cupboard. That infernal accordion. It was blocking my view, Mama swiveled. Liesel. The girl had the honor of pinning the flag to the window frame. Hans Jr. and Trudy came home for the afternoon eating, like they did at Christmas or Easter. Now it seemed like a good time to introduce them a little more comprehensively. Hans Jr. had the eyes of his father and the height. The silver in his eyes, however, wasn't warm, like Papa's. They had been furrowed. There was more flesh on his bones, too, and he had prickly blonde hair and skin like off-white paint. Trudy, or Trudel, as she was often known, was only a few inches taller than Mama. She had cloned Rosa Hubberman's unfortunate, waddlesome walking style, but the rest of her was much milder. Being a live-in housemaid in a wealthy part of Munich, she was most likely bored of children, but she was always capable of at least a few smiled words in Liesel's direction. She had soft lips, a quiet voice. They came home together on the train from Munich, and it didn't take long for old tensions to rise up. A short history of Hans Hubermann versus his son. The young man was a Nazi. His father was not. In the opinion of Hans Jr., the father... His father was part of an old, decrepit Germany, one that allowed everyone else to take it for their proverbial ride while its own people suffered. As a teenager, he was aware that his father had been called Der Kuden Maler, the Jew painter, for, Jewish, for painting Jewish houses. Then came an incident I'll fully present to you soon enough. The day Hans blew it, on a, the verge of joining the party, everyone knew you weren't supposed to paint over slurs written on a Jewish shop front. Such behavior was bad for Germany, and it was bad for the transgressor. So have they let you in yet? Hans Jr. was picking up where they'd left off at Christmas. In what? Take a guess. The party. No, I think they've forgotten about me. 
well, have you even tried again? You can't just sit around waiting for the new world to take it with you. You have to go out and be part of it, despite your past mistakes. Papa looked up. Mistakes? I've made many mistakes in my life, but not joining the Nazi party isn't one of them. They still have my application. You know that. But I couldn't go back to ask. I just... That was when a great shiver arrived. It waltzed through the window with the draft. Perhaps it was the breeze of the Third Reich gathering even greater strength. Or maybe it was just Europe again, breathing. Either way, it fell across them as their metallic eyes clashed like tin cans in the kitchen. You've never cared about this country, said Hans Jr. Not enough, anyway. Papa's eyes started corroding. It did not stop Hans Jr. He looked now for some reason at the girl, with her three books standing upright on the table as if in conversation. Lisa was silently mouthing the words as she read from one of them. And what trash is this girl reading? She should be reading Mein Kampf. Lisa looked up. Don't worry, Lisa, Papa said. Just keep reading. He doesn't know what he's saying. But Hans Jr. wasn't finished. He stepped closer and said, You're either for the Fuhrer or against him, and I can see that you're against him. You always have been. Liesl watched Hans Jr. in the face, fixated on the thinness of his lips and the rocky line of his bottom teeth. It's pathetic how a man can stand by and do nothing as a whole nation cleans up the garbage and makes itself great. Trudy and Mama sat silently, scaredly, as as did Liesl. There was the smell of pea soup, something burning, and confrontation. They were all waiting for the next words. They came from the sun just two of them. You coward. He upturned them into Papa's face. He and he promptly left the kitchen and the house. Ignoring futility, futility, Papa walked to the doorway and called out to his son, coward, I'm the coward. He then rushed to the gate and ran pleadingly after him. Mama hurried to the window, ripped away the flag and opened up. She, Trudy and Liesl all crowded together, watching a father catch up to his son and grab hold of him, begging him to stop. They could hear nothing but the manner in which Hans Junior shrugged loose was loud enough. The sight of Papa watching him walk away roared at them from up the street. Hansi, Mama finally cried out. Both Trudy and Liesl flinched from her voice. Come back. The boy was gone. Yes, the boy was gone. I wish I could tell you that everything worked out for the younger Hans Hubberman, but it didn't. When he vanished from Himmel Street that day in the name of the Fuhrer, he would hurtle through the events of another story, each step leading tragically to Russia, to Stalingrad. Some facts about Stalingrad. In 1942 and early 43 in that city, the sky was bleached sped sheet white each morning. All day long, as I carried the soles across it, that sheet was splashed with blood until it was full and bulging to the earth. In the evening, it would be wrung out and bleached again, ready for the next dawn. And that was when the fighting was only during the day. With his son gone, Hans, Hans Haberman stood for a few moments longer. The street looked so big. When he reappeared inside, Mama fixed her gaze on him, but no words were exchanged. She didn't admonish him at all, which, was, as you know, was highly unusual. Perhaps she decided that he was injured enough, having been labeled a coward by his only son. For a while, he remained silently at the table after, she, after the eating was finished. Was he really a coward, as his son had so brutally pointed out? Certainly, in World War I, he considered himself one. He attributed, he attributed his survival to it. But then... Is there cowardice in the acknowledgement of fear? Is there cowardice in being glad that you lived? His thoughts crisscrossed the table as he stared into it. Papa, Liesl asked, but he did not look at her. What was he talking about? What did he mean when nothing, Papa answered. He spoke quiet and calm to the table. It's nothing. Forget about him, Liesl. It took perhaps a minute for him to speak again. Shouldn't you be getting ready? He looked at her this time. Don't you have a bonfire to go to? Yes, Papa. The book thief went and changed into her Hitler youth uniform, and half an hour later, they left, walking to the BDM headquarters. From there, the children would be taken to the town square and their groups. Speeches would be made. A fire would be lit. A book would be stolen.